Hi, Jamie. Hello, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good. Good. And hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Yellowstone podcast, where my guest is Dr. Jamie Farrell. Dr. Farrell is with the University of Utah Seismograph Stations, where he is a research assistant professor in the Department of Geology and Geophysics. Jamie, thank you for your time. Thanks for having me. For many of us who live up here in Yellowstone and who love the Yellowstone area, the Holy Grail is not perhaps seen Grizzly Bear 399 and her three cubs or seen a wolf kill in the, the Lamar Valley. It's getting to watch Steamboat Geyser erupt. I've never seen it, you have. What is the, what is the sheer physical experience like? Well, I mean, aside from the fact that it's the tallest active geyser in the world, um, just the, the height of the eruption is pretty amazing. Um, the, for me, what was, you know, the most amazing was just the, the power, the, the energy that's being released during one of these eruptions. I mean, you can literally feel it shaking the ground. Um, it sounds like a jet engine, uh, firing off. You can see large chunks of rock being thrown, um, tens of feet in the air out of the vent. Um, and, um, how it sustains that energy for you know so long, just the amount of energy that's being output there is, is pretty amazing to me. Yes. Did you feel at any stage that you were in danger? I noticed that last year, I think it was, the Park Service put up signs warning people that their cars could get damaged from the silica-enriched water. Could that damage you? Could you have been hurt by one of those tennis ball sized rocks that were coming out? Um, there's definitely a chance that a, a rock could fall on the viewing platforms. In fact, um, I think it was last year, 2019, um, a large rock came down and actually broke the steamboat geyser sign that's on uh, the viewing platform. Um, people saw it coming, so they, 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 nobody was hurt or hit by the rock, but it broke the sign. Um, so there is a chance that some of these large rocks could come and, and uh, hit somebody, but um, you're not in any danger of the water. Um, the water, by the time it comes down, it's cooled off. Um, and it, it could ruin your, if you're wearing eyeglasses, the, the silica will, will ruin your eyeglasses. It'll bond to your glasses and you won't be able to see. In fact, my car was covered in silica um, once and uh, it's really hard to get off. I just basically ended up getting a new windshield actually, so. Did you have to take it to a body shop to deal with any damage to the, to the paint? No, no damage, no, no. Oh, fortunate. Now, I understand that this was on June the 4th, 2018, if I remember correctly. That's, that's the eruption that I witnessed, yes. Yes. And that the irony was that you guys were actually removing your equipment from Steamboat when you saw it erupt. Were Correct. you able to capture the data of that eruption or had you removed all your equipment beforehand? No, we hadn't started removing equipment yet. So yeah, we did record that eruption. That is, that is fortunate. I believe that in addition, in addition to your work at the University of Utah, you're also the chief seismologist for the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. That is correct. Could you explain what uh, the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory is and what it does? So the, the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory is one of many um, volcano observatories um, led by the United States Geological Survey. Um, and Yellowstone Volcano Observatory or YVO is um, kind of a collaborative um, um, venture between the United States Geological Survey and other organizations, including the University of Utah, um, Yellowstone National Park, um, University of Wyoming, the three state geological um, services from um, Idaho, Wyoming, uh, and Montana, um, as well as Montana State University, and an organization that runs the, the geodetic monitoring called UNAVCO out of Boulder, Colorado. And we have agreements that we will um, um, uh, do certain tasks. For example, the University of Utah, we um, operate the seismic network in Yellowstone. So our um, task as far as YVO is to 
um, locate um, and uh, identify earthquakes that are happening and put out relevant information um, um, for those earthquakes. And we provide that information to the public um, via various sources, our website, all the data goes to the USGS um, and we are in constant contact with the, the Park Service as well. Is it fair then to call Yellowstone a super volcano? Uh, a lot of people do. Um, I don't necessarily like the term super volcano um, because that kind of implies that Yellowstone only produces super volcanic eruptions, which are these really large explosive eruptions. Um, when in fact, it, it, most of the time it produces smaller eruptions, small lava flows or relatively smaller lava flows. So it, 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 it would be better to say that Yellowstone is a volcano that has produced super volcanic eruptions in the past. But um, even though a volcanic eruption is, is very rare um, and the chances are very low of that happening anytime soon, the most likely type of eruption would be a much smaller um, lava flow that would be entirely contained within within the park. And I would like to, to talk about that shortly, but I've noticed in my newsfeed that whenever we get a bunch of uh, earthquakes up here, and when I say up here, I'm in West Yellowstone, a couple of years ago, I think we had 200 earthquakes in a week. And shortly before that, there were more than that down uh, in West Thumb. Anytime something like that happens or that uh, steamboat starts erupting again, particularly the British tabloids start publishing stories that uh, the Yellowstone supervolcano is going to erupt. Do you have any yeah. thoughts? Yeah, it's something that we fight constantly. Um, this kind of over dramatiza dramatization of the, of the threat um, of Yellowstone. And, you know, you talked about um, uh, rises in earthquake rates. And in, in Yellowstone, we get what we call earthquake swarms, where we get this large amount of, of earthquakes, this high rate of earthquakes in both space and time. Um, and they happen quite often in Yellowstone. In fact, about half of the total seismicity in Yellowstone um, occur as part of earthquake swarms. And sometimes they're larger, sometimes they're smaller, like they can be they can last for only a few hours and have only you know, 10, 20 earthquakes, or sometimes they can last for almost a whole year and have thousands of earthquakes in them. And every time that happens, um, we get this uptick in interest in the Yellowstone volcano and um, kind of these doomsday scenarios that it means it's about to erupt, and it's just not the case. We discussed earlier, we communicated earlier about a lecture that you gave, I think it was in 2018, at the uh, Old Faithful Rec Hall. As you know, the Park Service here in Yellowstone does a fantastic job of providing training to tour companies such as ours. And I attended one of those lectures and there were two main things that I took away. One was, if I recall, you correctly, you said that there were three factors that needed to occur contemporaneously for there to be a chance for a Yellowstone volcano to erupt. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in our sense, uh, we in Yellowstone, we monitor for earthquake activity, we monitor for ground deformation, we don't, another organization does. Um, and the Park Service and USGS monitor the hydrothermal system um, for you know changes in activity, they monitor um, the amount of gas um, that's being released um, in certain parts of the park. Um, so, you know what I what I often tell people, what I probably said during that lecture you 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 referenced, is that you know when you have an uptick in one of those, say like an earthquake swarm where you have high rates of seismicity, and nothing else changes, there's no related ground deformation, there's no changes in the hydrothermal system. Um, that probably means that there's not um, magma moving up into the shallow crust. When that happens, you typically see changes in, in, in multiple um, signals. For example, you'd get uh, ground deformation associated with um, uh, seismicity changes, and you would see increased gas content. You would see major changes in the hydrothermal system. So, you know, if you're only seeing changes in one of those, that probably uh, doesn't mean that an eruption is more likely, but if all three of those things 
um, kind of are pointing to the same conclusion, um, then that's something that we need to look into and something that we would we would look into further and, and analyze to see if indeed there is magma um, moving into the shallow crust. Now, sometimes you can get changes in those things and it's not magma. It could be uh, hydrothermal fluids moving through the crust. It could be gases moving through the crust. Um, and uh, so there is, there is um, you know, some analysis that needs to be done to differentiate between um, those different things. If we could start heading back off on a path uh, back towards Steamboat, the second thing that I took away from your lecture, and please excuse me if I misunderstood you, you guys put seismometers down around the Old Faithful area, and, and in a moment, please explain what those are. And if I understood you correctly, you said that with enough work and enough resources, you'd be able to predict all faithful to within a minute. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, we're working on that. Um, and yeah, like you said, in, we've done this multiple times at Old Faithful. We've done it a few times at Steamboat where we put um, an array of seismometers and these are these little kind of quart jar sized um, white cylinders and we, we put them on the ground and they, they record ground movement um, in three different directions, so vertical, east, west, and north, south. Um, and they're sampling, they're taking a sample a thousand times a second. So they're, they're, they're recording ground movement in very high fidelity. And um, we can look at those signals and we can measure um, this, what we call hydrothermal tremor that's related to um, hydrothermal eruptions, geysers, um, and what we're really measuring is when, when this hot pressurized water is moving up through these conduits, you know, getting ready for the next eruption, you have bubbles that are being, that are being formed and bubbles that are collapsing. And each time that happens, that produces a seismic signal that we record. And we can track that as it moves up through um, the ground, getting ready for the next eruption. And um, depending on the geyser, um, there is this kind of precursory activity that we can use um, to model um, kind of when the next eruption is going to happen. And that only works if it happens pretty much the same way every single time, right? So if, if like, for example, if the signal looks the same um, every time before St uh, Old Faithful erupts, we can use that pattern to say, okay, this is where we are in the recharge um, cycle. And you know we can say okay it's going to erupt um, in the next you know so many minutes and you know we're working on that we're not quite there yet but if you know for example an old faithful it erupts on average about every 93 or so minutes and but every once in a while it throws in uh, what we call a short eruption interval right so every it'll erupt after about 60 minutes if it wasn't for those short eruption intervals it would be a lot easier. And, um, you know, within um, an hour or so before an eruption or even more, um, we can say Old Faithful is going to erupt within this one minute, two minute interval. interval. Um, but right now what we're working on is trying to figure out if we're on that kind of 60 minute trajectory or if we're on that typical 93 minute trajectory. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to figure that out. And if we can do that, looking at past data, um, the idea is that if we can put in permanent seismometers somewhere around this Old Faithful, um, we could provide a real-time kind of moving window um, of, of when uh, yellow, uh, Old Faithful um, is going to erupt next. But how would you power permanent seismometers? Because doesn't the battery expire in 30 days, Art? So these temporary ones we put in only last for about a month, um, but our permanent stations are on solar power. Um, they run with solar panels and, uh, and, and batteries that store energy. So if we put in a permanent one, it would have to be um, on, a solar, on a solar power system and, on, and, and uh, send out uh, data in real time through via a radio link or, or whatever. I was reading a report which quoted one of your colleagues, Professor Fan Chi Lin, mm -hmm. who said that scientists do not currently know what it is that causes a geyser like Old Faithful or Riverside or Daisy to erupt on a regular basis compared to Steamboat. Do you have any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, that's one of the reasons why we do some of these experiments to try to figure out that. Why are some geysers predictable? Why are most geysers not predictable? Um, in fact, the rarity is having a predictable geyser. Um, most of them are not predictable at all. And one hypothesis is, is that these geysers that are predictable tend to be kind of off on their own. Um, and the idea is that these geysers that are kind of by themselves um, and aren't connected to any nearby features, they don't have to compete for water. They don't have to compete for energy and heat. Um, like some other geysers do, like for example, Steamboat. We know Steamboat is connected to Cistern Spring, right? Because every time Steamboat has a major eruption, Cistern completely drains. Could so I the, just... two, the two are connected at depth and that competition for water and heat um, complicates the system and could make it so it's not predictable. And that's one hypothesis that we're trying to look at. And, but of course we have to collect data um, for many more systems in order to, to prove that or disprove that. With respect to the link between Cistern Spring and Steamboat, I was going to come to that later. One of your other colleagues, um, Sin Mei Wu, and I apologize if I get the, get the pronunciation incorrect, in a paper in which I read in which Mara Reed was the lead author, I think she said, and I stand to be corrected, that you were not able to find a link between or connection between steamboat and cistern springs in the first perhaps 140 meters. And she postulated that maybe the water is somehow seeping through the rocks. Yeah, so we, we don't see a direct connection between the two. Um, um, like you said, within the first 140 meters, which is the depth to where we have good resolution. So that means one of two things, either the connection is deeper than that and we just can't see it, or the connection isn't, isn't, um, is a seismic. It doesn't produce seismic signals that we're recording. So what that means is that the connection is probably through a kind of a diffuse system of, of fractures um, and cracks and not just like an open conduit, um, which is, is, is a possibility that they're connected through a more kind of uh, um, complicated system of fractures um, within that top 140 meters. So we're actually going to go back this spring, hopefully, and put in another array, um, and it's going to be larger so we can see deeper, and we'll kind of test that out. If we can see a connection um, deeper than 140 meters, um, then yeah, well, that, that'll be awesome. But if not, then yeah, that, that hypothesis that they're connected um, at the more shallow level, but through a you know, a system of fractures and cracks and not an open conduit would be our preferred um, interpretation. Yeah. For a layman like me, I'd just like to explain to our, to our listeners and our, and our viewers, when steamboat erupts, there's a hot pool, a, um, a spring just around the corner down a flight of stairs. And I remember going there last fall, early one morning, and the Steamboat just didn't look the same. And I went down the stairs and sure enough, cistern was either filling up or it was empty in one of the two. So mm -hmm. I clearly just missed an eruption. Yeah. Could you just elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, so what happens is when you have a, a major steamboat eruption, um, within the next, let's say about an hour after the eruption, cistern, the water level will start to go down and it'll slowly drain over the next um, 10 or so hours. And within a day, it's completely empty. And then it'll just start filling back up. And um, within about, I'd say, I don't know this for sure off the top of my head, but within you know, two or three days after the eruption, uh, cistern will be full again and overflowing until the next eruption. So um, again, you know, because th this has been a well-known um, feature for a long time. Since the 60s, people have noticed that this, this has occurred after major eruptions of steamboat. And it's, it has occurred after every single eruption that I know of um, up until the present. Um, so we were interested to see you know, how we could image that connection and, and what is the nature of that. So in conjunction with our seismic deployment, the Park Service had put in uh, temperature loggers um, in cistern 
um, and pressure transducers within cisterns. So we can track the water level, we can track the changes in temperature in relation to the seismic signals. And there's very, very interesting relationships between those two. For example, what we noticed is that right after a steamboat eruption, the temperature in cistern immediately starts to drop slowly, but almost an immediate response to the eruption. But the water level actually waits for about an hour till it starts draining. So that's interesting. Um, it's something that we could look into further. Um, and there's also these little minute changes in the temperature and in the boiling level um, of the pool that are that are clearly related to these different seismic signals that we're recording. So, and another thing is the repeatability of those signals. Every single thing that every single eruption sequence that we recorded um, in 2019, they all look almost identical. It just repeats itself almost exactly every single time. Um, so it's it's very interesting, and and I think it could provide us. Um, some more clues in the future about the dynamics of this connection and kind of the, the, the hydraulic nature of, of, of uh, that connection and what and of the plumbing system beneath the two. As a non-scientist, my ears perked up when I heard you say that the Park Service put monitors inside Cistern Spring. Yeah, they have they have temperature loggers in many different features. Um, for example, they have a temperature logger in the runoff system for steamboat. Well, the runoff, um, yes, I can understand, but how do you put a, something actually inside the spring to monitor the, the temperature? Yeah, it's just a cable and a, and a sensor that gets put in the pool um, to a certain depth. And depending on the pool, sometimes they get ruined by temperature, it's too hot. Um, but these are special instruments that can take those hot temperatures. Um, a lot of times they only last for so long because of the silica deposition on them. Um, um, but yeah, they have they have uh, temperature sensors in a lot of these features to help monitor for changes um, and for hazard assessment. Because you know, one hazard that happens quite often in Yellowstone, most of the time not in the developed areas, but you get what's called a hydrothermal uh, explosion. And what happens is these features, as they're as they're as they're uh, um, you know, as you have this hot silica-rich water coming up to the surface. As it cools off, it, it deposits these a lot of these minerals. And a lot of times they they kind of deposit so much that they kind of choke themselves off and pressure builds up and builds up until they explode. For example, pork chop is one yeah. of those features yeah. at Norris Geyser Basin that happened in the 80s, it exploded. 1985. Um, yeah. And um, and it happens, you know, at least you know, multiple times a year, probably most of the time in the backcountry, but it is a hazard and it could happen in in in, in a developed. Uh, geothermal basin, and it, and it could, there's a potential to injure somebody on the boardwalk with hot water, chunks of rock. Um, so a lot of these features we monitor for changes um, to see if we could see if, if something like that um, is about to happen. If we could um, get back to focusing on Steamboat specifically, in Mara Reed's article, um, What's from, from the proceedings of the National Academy of Science, Sciences. It was postulated that some earthquake activity might have been responsible for the repeated, the more continual, more frequent eruptions of steamboat. If memory serves me correct, correctly, it went off frequently in the 60s, the 80s, and then again starting in 2018. But the problem with that theory, it seems to me, is that surely an earthquake or a series of earthquakes would affect more than just one thermal feature. Yeah, I mean, that's just one hypothesis and it's not proven. Um, it's something that we look like, for example, I think what they were referring to is in 2013 and 2014, we had a series of earthquake swarms and there was a lot of ground deformation occurring at Nor around the Norris area. And it kind of culminated in a magnitude 4.8 earthquake that occurred in March of 2014. And um, as soon as that 4.8 magnitude earthquake occurred, the ground deformation abruptly turned around and started subsiding uh, in the area. So one hypothesis that has been made is that that um, time period was due to either an in, um, increased um, gas output or increased um, magma movement out of the caldera 
into the Norris area, which then has some sort of time delay, which triggered this latest eruption, these latest activity um, of steamboat. But you know, we can't really say that for sure. Like you said, we have increased. You know, steamboat has had some periods of high activity in the past, mainly in the '60s um, and in the '80s. And in fact, if you look at the record of steamboat eruptions, um, most of the steamboat eruptions that have been recorded have been in these periods of high activity. And there are very few eruptions outside of that. There is only, you know, maybe 10 or so outside of those three periods of, of high activity. So um, maybe this is just the way that steamboat works. Maybe it goes through these periods of active phases and then it kind of shuts down for a while. And uh, we, like, we don't quite understand why that would be or, or what would be the, the cause of that. Um, we do know that Steamboat um, in these last few years have, has changed its activity rate seasonally, right? For example, during the winter months, like now, it's only erupting maybe twice a month or something like that on average. But when you get into spring and summer where there's a lot more, the water tables rise up, right? You get more water then it moves up to like once a week, up to four or five eruptions per month. So there clearly is a seasonality to it, but these long-term changes, we don't quite understand. You mentioned um, talking about a migration from the Caldera area to Norris, but Norris is the most thermally active part of Yellowstone, isn't it? Well, it's the hottest, yeah. If I remember correctly, one of your colleagues, Dan, and I apologize for mandling his last name, Denusen? Zerishan. Zerishan, I'm sorry. Said that if thermal activity were in Olympics, Norris would get a gold medal. <laughs> he, he wrote that in the Caldera Chronicles. And just incidentally, for anyone who's listening or watching, the Caldera Chronicles is a wonderful resource. I generally read it on the Billings Gazette, which is a local newspaper. Go to billingsgazette.com. It has some great articles. In fact, you wrote one, didn't you, on your personal experience watching uh, Steamboat Erupt? Correct, yep. Yeah. Um, so with Norris being so thermally active, is it any surprise that we're seeing what we're seeing at the moment? No. It one reason why Norris is so interesting is that one, it's the hottest of all the, of the thermal basins um, in the park, and it's one of the most dynamic. So it sees more changes um, in activity um, than the other geyser basins. Um, for example, in, in Norris, we have what we call these thermal disturbances to where, you know, this happens, you know, annually or, or a few times a year. Um, where you see these widespread basin-wide changes to where features will get more turbid or they'll change their eruptive behavior. And it lasts for a little while and then it goes back to normal. And these, um, um, these thermal disturbances um, can be recognized based on uh, certain indicators. Um, certain um, features tend to respond to these disturbances more than others. Um, so, yeah, Norris is is really interesting in that it's um, a really intense geyser basin, um, but it's also very dynamic. There's always changes occurring. There's always kind of cool things happening um, that can provide insights into how these thermal basins um, actually work. When did you guys first start putting seismometers around Steamboat? The first time we put um, an array dedicated to Steamboat was in 2018. Um, but in back in 2003, there was a particularly um, strong thermal disturbance um, in, in Norris Geyser Basin. And in fact, there were these high ground temperatures. We had these new features pop up, um, which spilled mud on the boardwalk. So the Park Service actually had to close um, the back basin of Norris in 2003. And in response to that, we went in and put in um, a series of seismometers. One of them was by Steamboat. We put in some GPS instruments to measure ground deformation. Um, and then we've done a few of those experiment, experiments since then, I think 2006. Um, but these, these latest, and those all involved like, you know, one or seven, up to seven seismometers. Um, 
just for comparison, these latest um, experiments that we've done in 2018, we put 28 seismometers in just around steamboat and cistern. In 2019, we put 50 and we're trying to plan at a deployment of 140 um, this spring in the Norris Geyser Basin. So, um, um, you know, we've, we've, we've got these smaller seismometers now that we didn't have in the past that help us, that, that makes it easier to put out a lot of different instruments um, and put these really dense arrays that provide a lot of, a lot of information. If you get a big crowd of people walking by, does that give you a false signal? Oh yeah, we record everybody who walks by for sure. Um, distinguish between people walking by and uh, thermal activity? Well, a lot of times we end up just using data from nighttime where it's not as noisy. Um, there's not as yeah. many people driving. We, have, we actually have a permanent seismometer um, in the Norris Museum, in the building there, in the Norris Geyser Basin. Um, and that records, it's very noisy during the day from the people. And in fact, when we did, kind of interesting, when we did one of these deployments um, in the Upper Geyser Basin a few years back, um, I was looking at noise levels and it was very interesting. I was, I was mapping these noise levels and what I saw is the noise level up on Geyser Hill, which is this area of very high concentrated um, geyser activity behind Old Faithful across the river. You would see these, these 90 minute patterns of high uh, noise and it would drop off. And it dropped off every time there was an Old Faithful eruption because everybody left Geyser Hill to go watch Old Faithful. So we can, you know, if we had enough of these seismometers, we could track people along the boardwalks and we could tell if they turn left here or if they go straight or, or, or what. We could definitely track people walking along the boardwalks. Talking about across the river, when Beehive, for example, goes off, will your seismometers at All Faithful register that as well? No, um, we have had some uh, seismometers by Beehive and we recorded a few eruptions of Beehive. But what happens is these, these thermal basins um, are the, the, the very shallow crust is so highly fractured and filled with water. And these seismic signals are very high frequency signals. And these high frequency signals tend to what we call attenuate or drop off in power very fast um, as you get away from the source. So the seismometer at Old Faithful um, doesn't necessarily record a beehive eruption, although sometimes it could, depending on, like I said, if it's a very quiet time and it's at night, we could probably see it. Um, but typically you need one of these sensors fairly close to these individual um, uh, sources to record it directly. Um, there are some signal processing tricks that we can do to try to pull out these signals um, at farther distances, and we do that. Um, but typically we want sensors as close as we can get to, to these features to, to really directly record them. Trevi, I've taken up more than half an hour of your time, so I'll try and wrap up. How close are you to being able to predict Steamboat? Um, at the moment, not super close, but there are some signals that we see um, that we think that we might be able to use to predict a Steamboat eruption, but the problem is we won't really know that for sure until it comes out of this most recent active period. There is a signal that um, is is uh, that we can track, um, and then as soon as steamboat erupts, that signal goes away, and then you know about um, you know six to ten hours later, that signal comes back until the next eruption. Now we don't know for sure when steamboat's not in an active phase, is that signal still there? I and see. then it just goes away when steamboat erupts, or is it not there and it only occurs before a steamboat eruption? So if it's the latter, then yes, we can use that signal to predict a steamboat eruption. But if it's the former, then that wouldn't help us predict it. So what's something we're looking at, we're working on, um, um, but again, it'll take some more analysis and we'll actually we'll have to wait until Steamboat is not active anymore to, to put out some more sensors and record what it looks like when it's not active. Last question then is, um, when discussing the Mara Reed article, the New York Times described geysers as volcanically powered water cannons. Is that accurate? And is there a link between geysers and volcanoes? Uh, sure, a lot of volcanic areas have hydrothermal 
um, hydrothermal systems associated with them because you have this heat source at depth that's heating the groundwater. Um, but there are thermal areas outside of, of volcanic areas. For example, in the Western US, we see a lot of thermal areas that are associated with these faults. And faults are also conduits that can provide pathways for water to move down, be heated, and come back up. So um, there, there, a lot of times there are hydrothermal systems associated with volcanic areas, but it doesn't have to be um, that way. Jamie, thank you for your time. My guest today was Dr. Jamie Farrell from the University of Utah Seismograph Stations. Jamie, perhaps we could catch up again uh, once you've done your experiments this season. Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks for the time. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye-bye.